Are you ready to manage your work and personal world better to live a more fulfilling, productive life? Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. Here are your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud. Our show today is going to be about uh, second screen productivity and not really, it's a corollary of the concept of second screen where you use a mobile device while you're watching a television and you're accessing potentially uh, supplemental content and, and other information or you know interacting with social media while you are watching television. We're really going to be talking about hardware. The fact of the matter is, is that Augusto and I both recently got new tablets and while Augusto is the tablet Ninja. I mean, he's really the the uh, expert here in terms of using uh, his iPad only. He wrote a book on the topic. I am just getting really comfortable with using a tablet uh, for more than just watching Netflix. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about what we've been doing and how much more productive we have been as it relates to tablet productivity or even using your, your phone as a second device uh, and sort of the experience uh, we've, been, we've been having. You are using the iPad as a primary computing device and have been comfortable with that for many years. And in contrast, I have been using both iOS as well as the Google Android OS uh, for many years concurrently, but not really for uh, high-level activities. And only recently did I get a Samsung Galaxy and uh, the 8-inch variety so that it was large enough for me to be able to read on the screen. I had the Nexus 7 prior to that, which is the Google tablet, and I really loved it. It's thin, it's light, it's powerful. And uh, so the Samsung Galaxy tab that I have uh, also has a SIM card in it. So this one has data so that wherever I am, I can access, you know, just basic email and, and web browsing and that kind of thing when I'm on the road. So that's been really, really helpful. Uh, and it has, the case that I got has a stylus, you know, that plugs into it and, uh, and a magnetic screen case. And it's just really great. I have to, I have to admit, it, it does do much more today for me now that I'm able to uh, take notes, say, in Evernote on the larger screen and also... You know, just sort of getting around, I can see more email at once so I can process multiple emails, you know, that just need to be deleted. I don't have to scroll through page after page after page of email. I can quickly go through a full page as, just as I would on my uh, uh, laptop screen. I can do that here on the tablet as well. And so you, you don't process email on your phone, but you process it on the tablet. And it's a very similar interface. Since you're using, and I really like this idea here, I, I think that this is something not to be lost on people. That is, because you're using iOS across all of your devices, you are in essence creating the compound benefits based on the fact that you're going to know more and better of how iOS works, how your computing operating system works, because you are not having to switch gears every time you look at a different screen, because they're all the same. Am I correct there? You are correct there, even that I treat them as, as different screens. Um, as, you, as you correctly said, I, have, um, I don't check on anything on, on the iPhone. And the reason I do that is years ago, and, and it's still true, what I discovered with email is I was reading email multiple times. So I was with my phone getting distracted because it vibrate or let me know or give me a, some kind of indication or alert that I just received an email. Look at on my phone and then go somewhere else where then when I need back, went back to really process an email, then I prefer the bigger screen. I prefer the iPad. And then I went and then read that email again. Without any doubt, reading emails multiple times, it is highly inefficient. Okay. Uh, so that's the reason I came with a rule that I don't read email on my phone. And actually, I don't even have email configured because the problem for most people is if you cannot process email efficiently on your phone, and there is people who can, then you should not check email on your phone, period. If you have the systems and the workflow to do it, then that's totally fine. But if you are just checking to see if something is going to explode or not, 
and or to see, you know, just to be curious what is coming, you are really being highly ineffective. Not only that, if you are in like, you know, I receive between 100 and 150 emails a day, you know, I'm basically getting distracted 100 to 150 times a day. It's impossible to do anything of significance if you're getting distracted often by something that you are not doing anything with. You are just getting distracted. Look who is come. And then if it sounds fun or interesting, then open and see what it is just to discover, oh, I need to process this later. The exception to that is if I'm traveling. Uh, if I am traveling uh, while I'm in transit, then I may check email. Uh, while I'm transit, but as soon as I get to wherever I am, then I come to the settings of the phone and then turn email again off. So that way I'm accessible and available while I'm moving around, but not on the other on the other time. And the effect of that has been incredible. Uh, number one, you start looking your phone in a completely different way. And you discover ways to use your phone in a matter that is more effective. Um, if they someday, you know, I have come to to use often, uh, you know, the split screen ability on iOS. That's one of the reasons. I don't know even if someday Apple come with the ability to split a screen on my iPhone. If I want to do that on 6 you know, even that I have the largest, the iPhone Plus, the largest option you can have, you can be an iPad mini or even now, the 12 inch, you know, if you think on dimensions on the screen for people, an iPhone 6 Plus, okay, is the equivalent on size. Two of them are the equivalent on size to an iPad mini on a split screen. If you get now a 9.7 and do a split screen, is the equivalent to have two iPad minis. And if you get the 12.9 inches, is the equivalent of half two 9.7 inches. And that's one that's the biggest so powerful. You split that screen, and you really have two iPads side by side working with you. It's a shame not every developer has activated the split screen. There are a few um, that haven't, uh, but the ones who haven't really make it for an incredible, powerful thing. To be able to to work with two different applications in that split screen view I, on Android OS, uh, you know, you can do that for most applications as similar to iOS and I, I've actually really found it to be helpful you know like flashback to the 90s and uh, and just so everybody knows you know Windows has had the ability to what they call tile you know tile screens which is what I still call it screen tiling is the idea to work in multiple screens at once and it's had it I think since probably Windows 95 probably earlier than that but that's where I entered and I mean I I just I love the concept of it, and there was there's really not an easy way for that to be done on Mac OS X, and so I always lament that you know like on a on a Windows computer you right click on the the taskbar and you say tile you know Windows and whichever active windows you have open it automatically puts those up on the screen and splits them equally uh, on the screen so if you're working on data entry you're looking at a a, a PDF and you're trying to do data entry into Excel. You can easily do that, or if you need two different web browser windows open side by side while you're comparing uh, two Google documents, you can do that as well. And so that's super, super helpful. On iOS now, and probably for a couple of iterations, uh, it's limited again to what the developer you know, has done or not done. It doesn't work with every configuration on every application. But if you click on iOS on the green button. Uh, you have basically a red, a gray, and a green button to expand or compress the, the screen. But if you click on the green and let it press, they will tell you on that application what abilities you have to do the equivalent of tile. So to make this app full screen on half of the screen, three quarters of the screen, or just a quarter of the screen, um, depending on what the developer has decided the minimum size that it can work. And it's really useful for things like comparing two Google Docs documents because now you can open both side by side and allow Apple to consider or Mac OS to consider that two full documents. And this really comes down to uh, how we're using our tablets productively now in our worlds because I'm using that tablet screen 
as that second screen more often than not. You know, I usually have a Windows computer in front of me. I typically have a Mac OS, you know, uh, device in front of me, either, you know, one of my MacBooks. And now I'm having this this screen in front of me. And uh, and then occasionally I have a Linux laptop as well um, that I've been running Linux Mint on. And so having that screen has now allowed me to open up another say if I'm referencing a PDF, I will typically have that open on the the mobile tablet to be able to view that data while I'm entering it into my primary, you know, keyboard, whichever primary keyboard I'm using at that moment. And that's actually been really, really helpful because I've I it's it's very quick and simple for me to be able to have the applications that have all of my data in them because they're in cloud storage, you know, options, whether that be Google Drive, Dropbox, or otherwise. And uh, so pulling them up and open, you know, even opening up a PDF or uh, an image that I've taken picture of a page in a book, you know, that I that I want to reference, uh, I just open it up from Evernote and it's there. I can read it and data enter that stuff. And uh, so just a couple of things that I think would be helpful for folks to, to sort of think about when it comes to uh, tablet productivity is that what I've decided to do is across all of my mobile devices, since I've made that transition um, while I still use iOS in, in testing and, and other environments uh, in production, I'm only using that is in the real world that I'm you know running around all the time for work. I'm actually using Android OS for all of my mobile devices now. The idea for me is to have my home screen be a sort of a base station for easy access to my most frequently used applications. And uh, while this is different between iOS and Android, um, I've just chosen to orient that home page to have the, the widgets and folders dedicated to the most um, primary stuff, right? And so I've actually created a series of folders that um, help me just sort of understand uh, what it is that I'm doing. And so I've chosen a couple of verbs, you know, so like I have a, a folder called read, and that allows me to have all of my news applications, my Amazon Kindle app, uh, my library application, news and weather, which is the Google news and weather application, and my, my RSS feed reader, I use Feedly. And so all of those are in the read read you know, folder. And when I look at it, I know that's read. So that's where I can do that. So if I'm in a space where I don't have headphones, I'm going to be in an environment where it's quiet, I'm going to be able to read as opposed to listen. Uh, and then I have my listen folder. So my listen folder has my audio, my library audio app, which I use overdrive, which is awesome. And I have my NPR news app, I have Stitcher and Google Play Music and some podcast applications all in the listen app. So I can if I want to listen to an audiobook, I have headphones with me. And uh, uh, and I have some time between, you know, say I'm on a layover, I'm in a space where I can do that, I can go ahead and do that. So I've uh, just as a as these, this is not an archetype for anyone, but I just figure, you know, it's good to know, I have um, read, listen, watch, right. And that actually matches my, my, uh, my system across my entire system, wherever I have uh, sort of read later opportunities, they're going to be listen, read, and watch. Right? Those are the things that we can we can do input wise as humans. And so, uh, and as soon as computers give the ability to taste, I'll <laughs> I'll add a context for taste. Uh, but the but the reality is is that I have listen, read, and watch. Uh, and so I have those uh, there. I have create, which is basically all of my, uh, you know, Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, but it also includes, you know, Dropbox and Google Drive. Then I have a context for communicate, which includes all of my messaging apps and phone apps. And, and, and then I have a learn it has, you know, my Duolingo and my other language apps and all the other MOOC apps like Coursera and Udemy and uh, other apps like that. And that's really just been very, very helpful for me to streamline it down to what fits into those folders. And, you know, I have other folders as well. You know, I have a, a money folder, which is for apps that I, for shopping and for purchasing and Android Pay and Google Wallet and PayPal and so on and so forth. All of those are in there. And I have a work one, which includes all the work applications that I use. But the primary point of me talking about this was that I like the idea of having having those verbs to tell you what you're going to do, very similar to defining the next action in getting things done uh, methodology. It's all about what is the thing that you have to do? What is that action that you're going to take? And being able to look at your phone on, an, on your mobile tablet and decide on what that's going to be is very useful. For me, for me, it's again, about simplest 
you know, and and I have always laughed and I open to you when you mention all the device and I understand for what you do, the devices uh, are critical. But uh, I begin simplifying in the name of focus uh, many, many years ago. So for me, screens, even context, I used to have at some time on my life, context of context of context, context. And today I have really six of them. But in general, I want to go back to that level of simplicity. And it is not other than allows me to keep my focus for longer. That allows me also to accomplish more in less time. Um, so the, the, the no answer to what you're saying is my screens, you know, I carry with me, you know, two or three devices depending where I am. I have my iPad 12. That is set up in a way, mostly because that is my main machine. I still carry with me my iPad mini that now is set up in a different way because it's set up more as a reading consumption device. So it's set up in a completely different way. And finally, I have my iPhone that if someday Apple is kind enough to do an Apple Watch that can make phone calls without having an iPhone, I basically will get rid of it because I don't use it anymore. I my iPhone has returned to be now a place where I make phone calls and uh, has been relegated really back to a phone. I use it for a phone or as a data terminal. When I bought the iPad, I decided I wasn't going to get the one with the Wi-Fi because anyways, I need to carry the phone so I could use the phone as a data terminal. But that's pretty much for what I use. It. There is nothing really... Uh, there is a, a little that I do in my day to day on the iPhone in comparison to what I will have done years ago. And I think one of the things we tend to to do is be conscious or unconscious and mostly unconscious. We tend to overcomplicate and we tend to do things in a way that is way more complicated than what we need. And what we don't know that is that, that is not me at all, Gusto. <laughs> I did not say your name on all this explanation. But that said, we tend to, and by the way, I was guilty of that. Okay, I years ago when you know when the pump way before iPhones and, and all that, um, you know, I had a pump pilot, and I remember when Palm came with the option to add color to their calendar, okay? And this is around 2000, beginning of 2000, 2001, maybe, maybe 2002. Um, and I spent, I'm not going to admit how many hours, okay, figuring out I had a color palm at that time, but my palm did not, did a rollout of the system backwards. They announced that as a feature for the new machine. And I spent, I'm not going to say how many hours breaking and hack into my palm so I could have the calendar application with the colors on my current hardware. Given I was in college and I could not afford the, the palm pilot that I wanted, okay? <laughs> beside it, okay? And, and same thing, I had Mac, I had Windows, and for many, many years, I spent a ridiculous amount of time overcomplicating the things I could do. Truth. I could do things that people will not dream to do at that time um, on their devices, but it was worth it to overcomplicate it. I don't know. I can tell you I learned a lot. I don't know if it was worth it from a productivity point of view. Okay, um, From the geek point of view, I had a lot of fun. But in uh, 2007, when I moved from the PD world, and, and I shut down my PC for the last time and moved to a Mac OS, one of the things that I wanted to accomplish was to simplify my computer needs. Um, that was part of the reason when the iPad was announced years later, I was so excited. Because as limited as may have seen at that time, I understood that having pages and numbers what was 90% of the world needs including myself. Oh, could sometimes I run into things that would love to have a really powerful thing? Yes, I do. And that's normal. And that's happened to everybody. But it's so rare when that happens that, you know, doesn't matter anymore. 
on an iPad basically give you eight hours of work. So that means I'm working more than an hour. Shame on me. But that's different discussion. Um, but the fact is that simplicity allows me to then, instead of focus how my geek heart is going to do X, to really finish X in less time. And that, for me, is one of the powers of that focus and that simplicity. In the interest of simplicity, as you were talking about, Augusto, you know, we need to all remember that there are some really amazing web applications out there that have mobile apps, and we need to make a choice when we put those on our tablets. You know, our tablets tend to have less memory outside of your iPad Pro. <laughs> for the rest of us, the, you know, our, our, our tablets, our tablets actually have usually less memory and uh, your operating system actually slows down when you, when you start to fill it up with too many applications. And so one of the things that I think can be really helpful is for you to go in and decide which applications actually have comparable mobile applications for doing those things. So I'll give a couple of, ex of examples that, of ones that I've used and have just chosen that I'm going to use those mobile applications as opposed to the full mobile app that you install from, say, the iOS App Store or through Android, uh, the Android Google Play Store. And so um, for example, there's an application called Telegram, which is a messaging communication application, and I use that with my clients uh, because it's open source and I um, and it's secure, you know, and I can I can feel comfortable doing that. Uh, and so we go ahead and use Telegram uh, for these for these communications. And on the tablet, I actually use the the web app. It's the mobile version, or I guess it's just responsive. And so the web app itself loads in the browser. And so on my on my home screen, you know. There's the Telegram icon. It looks like the normal mobile application icon, but it actually just opens up a web version that's full screen, and it does everything the mobile application does. I don't need it to be any more fancy. You know, it's not like it's doing anything more than just messaging. So don't need it. You know, Facebook. Facebook is a huge application on mobile devices. You know, it's probably over 100 megabytes or even more than that. Plus, if you install Messenger and you install Pages, which if you have a Facebook page or multiple Facebook pages, uh, you know, you're running many, many different Facebook applications. That's a big footprint on your mobile device. And it turns out that the Facebook mobile application works just fine for my needs. It may not for yours, but it does for mine. I very rarely log into Facebook proper. Um, you know, I interact and engage in multiple professional groups on Facebook, uh, you know, and so I'm in the groups app and I'm in Messenger, you know, communicating one to one with a variety of friends and family. But I just don't interact with Facebook's newsfeed uh, enough on a mobile device. You know, I'll, I'll do that on the on the desktop, but I'm just not going to do that on the mobile device. So I don't need the app. So that saves me 100 megabytes of, or more of space that then is constantly running in the background, updating and doing all of that stuff. So just for purposes of thinking about that, because you can bookmark or create a shortcut to web pages that you frequently access, you can also link to the mobile version of a lot of applications without needing to actually download and install the app. One cool productive benefit is that if you have an app that sends a lot of push notifications inside the mobile app, like notifying you about things you don't want to know, by enabling the browser version that's just going to open it up in your, you know, either Safari or Chrome or whatever mobile app, mobile web browser you're using, uh, you're really eliminating that an unnecessary notification push that happens on the regular on your mobile device. So I highly recommend that. Um, speaking about pushing things, there is a program called PushBullet, and PushBullet is the is this tool that I use quite frequently for being able to push tabs of my browser or different kinds of data from one device to the other. So I'll give you an example. I'm wor I work in primarily Google Chrome. Uh, you know, across my ecosystem. And so I am in Chrome, in the Chrome browser on my mobile tablet, and I see a web page that's really cool, but it's not really mobile responsive. It's just not a mobile website. So it's just not displaying properly. I can click on the share icon in the mobile browser and click on push bullet and push bullet will give me a list of my devices all of the devices that have push bullet on it. And I can select, you know, the desktop Chrome browser on my uh, MacBook Air 13 inch. And now it will literally open up a new tab in real time of that 
browser tab. And now that web page that wasn't displaying properly on the mobile tablet now displays properly on the desktop. And I can now um, interact and engage with it on the full screen. And I didn't have to copy and paste, email myself a link, you know, what have you. It just automatically does all of that stuff. If I'm on my phone and uh, this happens to me quite frequently, I look at a whole bunch of websites, you know, and now I have a bunch of tabs open in the mobile browser. Well, I could just click on push bullet and push those to the desktop, which I can then process really easily without it sitting open and taking up space on my mobile browser, you know, in the mobile browsing app. So push bullet is really, really great for that kind of stuff. So just to keep keep in mind that you don't need to use up a lot of space on your device if you use the right things, which is bookmarking, shortcuts, and even push bullet. You know, one of the great things of the show is we disagree openly with each other. Oh, yeah. I will disagree on that because... What most people don't know is develop for mobile, it's a pain, mostly because as with computers, we have come to a kind of a standard on resolutions and things. When you get to mobile, that is all throw out of the window. Uh, maybe someday we will, get, we will get there, but right now that we are in fight against people who produce devices and resolutions and all that, everything changed that make a challenge and what works great even on on that device that you have on that samsung now you put it on an ipad and doesn't work and vice versa and it's nothing to do with apple or samsung or any other or google devices it has to do with the back end the code and the software uh, that's number one number two um one of the things i believe make really powerful the, this new generation of tablets and mobile device are the apps. And in many cases, really, the, the applications don't use as much space as they use on, on a regular computer. And you could fit a lot more applications than what you uh, expect on it. Uh, the other thing is because not everything works really well on a mobile device, then it gets to be painful. If the app version, you know, or web mobile version works great, then that's fantastic. You can even go and create a direct access on your desktop and all that. But uh, my experience tend to fail more than succeed um, with that. And I found then maybe sometimes they were great on the big iPad, but then you go and ask, try to access from the phone and it doesn't work. That make it really frustrating for me. Uh, so I am a big proponent of apps. I like apps. I like when things work. And that has always been the case. Also, I think it's important for people to take into consideration that in the same way, when you move from a Mac to a PC or from a PC to a Mac, things change and are different. Happen the same thing when you go to the tablet. Most people I know don't have the ability to do what you do. That is having six OS and constantly working effectively on them. Most people I know can handle one. And that make a difference. When you are working now on a tablet, understand that it's going to work differently. And unless you move in, you are never going to do with that thing more than play. You want that to be a really productive device, then you need to move in. You need to make that your main device. But if every time you find a problem, and you will, instead of try to spend the five minutes it's going to take you to solve it, you go and immediately jump to the Mac or the PC or the traditional device instead of try to solve it, you are never going to make that your, your main device. Part of the reason I can do so much on my iPad, as you said, is because that's my main device for years. I've been living on iOS for the last five years, around 2012, and I don't carry a Mac. I don't have a Mac, and I don't. I have a Mac at home that is plugged to a charger, and I will be afraid to try to use that battery these days because I. the only reason I keep it around is so once in a while I can play with iTunes and the movies for the kids. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> What do they call I, that? They call I, that they call that parenting by iPad or par parenting by Netflix. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, it is. It is a reality. We were traveling. A point aside of all this discussion, we were traveling recently because of spring break of the kids, and uh, we got to the hotel. And they turned on the TV in the hotel as we were unpacking and all this, 
and my four-year-old came really mad and said, my movie stops. And I went there. Well, there was not that the movie stopped. There was a commercial, okay? We cut the cable many years ago. So for them, TV is Apple TV or Netflix. They don't understand what a commercial is. They really don't know what a commercial is because they don't watch them at all. We were in the hotel and he saw the commercial. I was like, why my movie stopped? That doesn't make sense. It wasn't. And he's right. But that's what he's used to. That's amazing. Yeah, when you talk about when you talk about the the uh, movement from uh, desktop to mobile and back, uh, I just want folks to know that there are some options out there, uh, at least on on Android OS, and, and I I'll find this out and put this in the show notes um, to to clarify. But I use uh, the Chrome Remote Desktop uh, for purposes of accessing. Now that I have the mobile tablet and it has uh, broadband access on it, where I don't have to tether, you know, typically I'll tether. I would tether my old tablet to my phone for accessing internet now i just just i'm on the mobile broadband tablet so i can just do that um as a oh i'm going to take an aside here which is that uh really oddly enough i use ift ifttt if this then that so it's at ift ifttt.com so it's three t's uh it's an an automation tool for lots of different web services but one of the things you can have it do is interact and engage with your phone right and so since your my tablet now has its own phone number, I had to create a separate IFT account for that functionality. So if I wanted things to come directly to my mobile tablet and not to my like sending a text message or those kinds of things, uh, it it needed a separate IFT account. So if any of you are deciding on getting a tablet and getting its own, with, with with its own SIM card, its old mobile broadband plan, just take that into account that you it it. Ift only allows you to connect to one phone number. So if you want to actually split up your contexts in terms of what's going to be done on your mobile tablet versus your phone, which in my case I did, I wanted messages to only be some of those messages that I want to send to myself on a regular basis to, as reminders. I only wanted them on my tablet. Well, you need that two Ift accounts in order to basically do that. Eh, it was it was a minor inconvenience, but it it made me it allowed me to be able to set up the additional workflow automations, which is kind of awesome. Okay. Back to my primary point, which was that I, cre- I I install Chrome Remote Desktop. It's a it's an extension slash app, I suppose, that lives inside of Google Chrome, the browser, and then you install the application on, from the Google Play Store on your Android tablet. And I I I don't know if it's available on on iOS, and I'll I'll have to I'll have to look that up. I'm actually searching for it right now. Um, and yes, it is available on iOS. I actually have it installed in. In my machine, uh, I have not for accessing my computer, but for accessing my parents' computer. So there when you they go. need troubleshoot, uh, that's how I troubleshoot my pattern. My patterns, as a parent, um, I ask them to get into their computer, and I then manage with Google Chrome. Yep, there you go. So, so this is a really, really great application, especially you know on a phone. Not so easy to use a remote access tool like that. You can; it's totally doable. Uh, but with the tablet, I've been able to be on the road, and uh, and and since I have multiple offices, you know the 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 office that I don't go to very frequently, I'm only there maybe two or three days of every month. You know that computer that sits there and has quite a bit of um, important. Uh, database software that you know we don't want to be accessed really but on that computer well it's there now and I could just go ahead and log into it from anywhere and I've got the Google Chrome remote desktop and it has all of my computers so if any one of them is sitting on and open um, you know connected to the internet that is it's I can log into it and now have access to it and it's super super helpful as Augusto said it's great to have it installed on a on a you know someone who is elderly or a parents you know device where you need to be able to log in and be able to help them this can even work in the opposite if you have children and you spend a lot of time on the road and you want to be able to help them with homework or working on a paper or something like that together in real time uh, you can either use Google Docs but also for um, you being able to interact and engage with their entire computer screen, you can go ahead and use Google Chrome's uh, remote desktop application. And um, the other side to that is TeamViewer. TeamViewer is a free application where you can, you have various levels. You can, you can have it just host, so you can always log in remotely. You can have it um, on the computer for, so say, you know, your, your 
parent or your mother, father, grandfather, aunt, uncle um, doesn't want you always having access to log into their computer, TeamViewer gives them the, the ability to be able to sit there, read a code on the screen when they open up TeamViewer, and then you punch that code in over the phone, and now you have access to it. So it gives you the ability to go ahead and access it only when the person on the other side gives you you know, the, the ability to do so, which gives people sometimes a level of, of privacy and comfort that they can compute without, you know, um, someone look, lurking over their shoulders. Uh, so I really do like um, the ability on the mobile tablet now to, you know, have a mobile uh, keyboard, have the tablet, you know, and when I'm sitting on a plane, train, you know, or, or whatever passenger vehicles, uh, you know, and, and I'm just sort of getting work done, I can now access both my apps on my phone uh, or web apps that I'm logging into and using, but now I can also log into computers that might have full software like, you know, Adobe Premiere for video editing or, you know, Audacity, which I use for, uh, you know, the podcast editing or applications like that, that I, I don't have a web application parity uh, for that. So I need to be able to access a desktop that can do that work and now I can and it's pretty seamless so pretty cool stuff there well and and also you know when for the people that you are going to be helping and, and accessing this remote in case we're talking about they have that when you log in remotely their Google if you use the Google Chrome it will tell them that somebody is looking so it will tell them on the screen so if they have that concern for whatever reason you can explain to them no no you are going to have the ability to know this is happening because it's going to set at the bottom of your screen somebody is looking at you and is going to tell you so in case you get those concerns that are completely valid then that way you can get you can explain them how that's going to work so they are not concerned about those things Absolutely. And, and I think it's really important when you are helping uh, family and friends, you know, in that remote environment to just make sure they're comfortable with what you're with what you're doing. And I think all of us, you know, who are more tech savvy, more, you know, more productivity oriented tend to be more technologically savvy. That's not necessarily true. So if you're listening and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm a total technophobe. That's OK. Uh, we're not. <laughs> but But it just turns out that, you know, People who, who tend to be tech savvy uh, tend to forget that we need to move slower with people who are, are not more comfortable with it. Even if what you're doing, they don't need to see, it's really helpful to just slow down so they don't feel overwhelmed by by what you're doing. Or as I tell, I have a family friend who is elderly and I will just tell her, you step away <laughs> and let me do what I'm going to do, uh, which is like updating, you know, the doing the updates for the operating system and those kinds of things, you know, and security updates and whatever, which would, which would literally causes anxiety for her when she's watching these things done. It's like, you just go sit down, have a cup of tea and I will go do this. And that way you don't have to actually worry about it. So I'll remotely log in and take care of those things. And and I find that to be much better, you know, but if they're in front of your screen with you, just walking through what you're doing and actually explaining what you're doing as you're doing it sometimes helps them reduce their anxiety as it relates to the computing experience and makes them more comfortable with it. So that's just a, just a little tip there. If you go back to 2000, and I understand now 10 years ago, that is a lot. The way computing was going was you were upgrading your computer every, every day and computer needs were growing at that time because people and consumers were doing that. When the recession hit on 2007, people said, oh, I cannot pay my mortgage. I cannot buy a new computer. And that was a moment where really computing as we know it, or at least for the, for, for the, for the geeks at heart who understood what was happening under, under the hood, changed. And that's even Microsoft came and everything how their system to create that will work in older machines because they understood that the game as it was being played was not going to be played anymore. When, again, those same times, you know, I was able to write documents you know, as you do now on tablet when I had a Palm Pilot. Um, but that was for something that was only available for the people who were a geek at heart. Now, that's me. That's available for everybody. Not only that, it's actually simpler for most people who don't need the complexity of a computer and a software and just need something that works. 
the biggest barricade to move from a traditional computer environment to a tablet is your mouse, or I may say your addiction to the mouse. A tablet, for most users, and I will argue that more than what people think, it's more powerful than most of the laptops and desktops people have. But it's that addiction to the mouse that make them think that it's impossible to move and to do things in there. Start considering simplifying for them simply in the name of the focus, because you will discover that you will deal much less with the technology, especially if you don't like dealing with technology, and will then spend more time doing exactly what you like and enjoy. And I think I can agree with that. I think that it's really important for us all to recognize that once, if you're going to use a, a, a tool, you should really just get to know it well. And the more you get to know it, the more productive you can be with it, mostly by knowing its limitations. I don't think that knowing the limitations of something means that that thing isn't good enough for you. It's knowing the thing as being powerful enough to be able to to work. I think it's really important for people to be able to work with the limitations versus really thinking that they're going to know very little about the device and or tool, whatever that tool is, and just keep working in the very limited arena that they have been working. You know, I think that's what most people do. They work in this little tiny um, narrow band of productivity because they don't know how the device works. And they think that the device is working potentially correctly but it has a limitation and we don't learn how to get around those, you know, create workarounds of limitations or that some limitations of mobile tablets are actually imposed upon you by default that you can turn off. You can, you can opt out of the limitation and, uh, and you can actually be more productive by doing so, by learning the tool fully. Um, and, and so I, I, I really, you know, well, I am somebody who, uh, for, for um, good professional reasons, I use many different operating systems. I still think it's really, really cool, El Bagusto, that you use one primary operating system across all of your devices and, and, and just knowing the productive gains that you get for being able to do so, I think is really powerful from a productivity perspective. So hat tip to you. And uh, and so that closes out this episode of Productivity Cast, the weekly show of all things productivity. I'm Ray Sidney Smith. And I'm Augusto Pinot. Thanks so much. Here's to your productive life, everybody. That's it for this episode of Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity with your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinot.